Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Um, please remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium, and also please remember to fill out and return your program evaluations. Uh, and if you can give the CME committee any ideas in regards to future topics and future speakers, we are always appreciative. Uh, today, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Casey Strosel. Dr. Strosel is a board certified uh, psychiatrist, and she currently is the medical director of the Behavioral Health Unit here at Mary Greeley Medical Center. Uh, and she uh, has kindly uh, accepted our invitation uh, to provide us with an update today on geriatric mental health. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Strosel. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Um, so this is my second time presenting Grand Rounds. Um, usually I'm given very broad topics to try to boil down. So um, today's topic is geriatric mental health. Um, the state of psychiatry in Iowa is just that there's a, a really big shortage of psychiatric providers. Um, we'll be losing another provider here in Ames, so it's important to, to try and keep up on uh, mental health needs for all providers because um, we're not doing most of the work. We're, we're just trying to, to supplement what um, those in the primary care fields do. So I have no financial um, disclosures to make. Um, one thing to note is that the medications being recommended in um, some of these uses are off-label. Um, I think one would find that most um, psychiatric medications are used off-label because once they have one or two indications for medication, they stop doing research um, uh, to get further indications. So, um, so we're going to start out, I narrowed it down to, to three topics to try and cover today and uh, hopefully in this 50 minutes. Um, the first one would be depression in the elderly and how that's different from depression in general population. Um, neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia and also delirium. And delirium can happen in an age population, but we do see it more commonly in uh, geriatrics, and that's why we're talking about that today. All right, we'll start out with depression. So my kids, I have three boys, they all really like comics, and so there's a few comics mixed in here. So types of depression. So most of what is seen in primary care settings is often um, mild or minor depression. Um, and psychiatry use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and that's an other specified depressive disorder. Um, the major depressive disorder meets, um, has more symptoms. Um, you can also have persistent, persistent depressive disorder, which has fewer symptoms, but a longer duration, two years or more. Um, bipolar disorder with depressed episodes, um, mood disorder secondary to a uh, general medical condition, which can be anything, uh, including hypothyroidism, uh, post-stroke, post-MI, um, as well as substance-induced mood disorders. Those don't need to be illicit substances. They can be alcohol. They can be their prescribed medications, including antihypertensives, uh, oral contraceptive steroids, um, even prescribed opiates. And then uh, adjustment disorder with depressed mood, uh, which is uh, depression that is related to a stressor in their life that's caused more symptoms than one would expect for the circumstances. Symptoms of depression. Um, so SIGI caps is the mnemonic for uh, depressive symptoms. Uh, sleep alterations, which could be increased sleep if they have an atypical depression or decreased sleep. Uh, interest. So. Um, what we would refer to as anhedonia, not enjoying things as they used to, uh, feeling guilty or worthless, decreased energy or having fatigue, uh, difficulty concentrating or having an inability to make decisions for oneself, uh, appetite, which in atypical depression could be increased or um, often is decreased, psychomotor agitation or retardation, and as well as suicidal ideation. So some of the more, the more commonly seen symptoms in the elderly are psychomotor agitation or uh, retardation. So psychomotor retardation is um, those patients that, that really can't keep still. They look anxious, they're pacing, um, and they're fidgeting. Psychomotor retardation is when um, someone just, their movements appear slow. Their talking is slow, they're walking slowly, even their hand movements are slower. Cognitive impairments are often seen in, the, in depression in the elderly. Um, those often are uh, problems with retrieval of information. So if 
you test their memory and they get only one out of three items on a, a delay. If you give them three things to remember, they can only remember one of them. Often with depression, if you cue them on a category, for example, my standard three items that I use are apple, penny, and table. If they can't get um, a, an apple, I would say it was a fruit. Now, if they had dementia, they wouldn't be able to pull out apple, but if they're suffering from depression, they're more likely to be able to remember that it was a, an apple. Um, apathy is another symptom, as well as social withdrawal, so not participating in activities that they used to do, not going to family functions, or spending time with their friends. So bereavement makes uh, de diagnosing depression more complicated. Prior to our current um, diagnostic statistical manual, uh, if a person was in an episode of bereavement, it excluded a diagnosis of major depressive disorder, unless it was accompanied by um, psychotic symptoms or suicidal thoughts. So the research demonstrated that bereavement, just like any other major life stressor, moving, uh, job change, etc., is just as likely to cause a depressive episode, and so it was taken out of the exclusionary criteria. And people who develop depression, secondary to bereavement, tend to experience more suffering, feel worthless, and may have suicidal thoughts. And I feel like that's pertinent to um, the elderly because they are in a, a subset where they're experiencing more loss of loved ones, of friends, and uh, family members. Um, so such differences between bereavement and major depressive disorder for that reason. Uh, major depression, depression, there is a persistently depressed mood, and whereas in bereavement they have feelings of emptiness or loss. Um, that tends to decrease in intensity over the course of time. So over days to weeks, that um, emptiness and loss improves, whereas in depression, that continues. Um, bereavement also tends to occur in waves. So often when reminded of their, their loved one, they feel more sadness or loss. Um, in bereavement, people tend to have a preoccupation with the deceased, so their thoughts tend to, to dwell with them. Um, their self-esteem is preserved. So they don't feel differently about themselves, whereas um, someone with major depressive depression feels pessimistic. They feel critical of themselves. Um, they feel worthless. Sometimes they're self-loathing. Um, if in bereavement someone does feel um, they have self-derogatory thoughts, those usually um, are the result of feeling like they should have something done something different, like they failed their deceased uh, in some way, that they could have done more, they could have done something differently. Um, suicidal thoughts in depression tend to be focused on someone's feelings of worthlessness, that they want to end their own pain, um, that they don't deserve life, whereas in bereavement, those suicidal thoughts tend to be just about joining their loved one. So they want to be reunited with their lost loved one. So treatment of depression. Um, SSRIs, which would be the, for the first line of treatment, um, treatment of choice, SNRIs, so those act on serotonin and norepinephrine, um, something like venlafaxine or duloxetine. Tricyclic antidepressants can be used. They're less commonly used in the geriatric population just because they do have more anticholinergic effects than SSRIs and SNRIs. Um, atypical antidepressants would be those like bupropion or mirtazapine. ECT can be used, as can psychotherapy. Um, one thing to know about antidepressant treatment is that they are less, less efficacious in mild depression. So if you have someone that has low-lying depression, they may be better served by, uh, with psychotherapy. So talking more about SSRIs. Um, so one thing to note with any population, but especially geriatric populations, is that we find that um, patients are undertreated. So it's true that we need to start those medications at lower doses for the elderly, but we need to titrate them up to the same dose as we would treat any other adult. Um, adult uh, elderly also need to be monitored for hyponatremia because SSRIs and SNRIs um, can both cause um, SAADH. Um, so telegram is one special instance of SSRIs to be careful in the elderly. 
Um, there's a black box warning on it due to uh, QTC prolongation and cardiac risk. So in people greater than 20, 65 years old, um, doses of 20 milligrams um, is the highest dose to use. And if you exceed 20 milligrams, regular EKGs need to be completed. So I included this uh, slide in my last grand rounds just because I feel like it's a good um, reference to what the appropriate dosing is. Um, we see a lot of patients, like I said, that are undertreated. This table gives you um, what an effective dose of the medication would be. So often we'll see uh, patients on, uh, especially elderly patients, on 10 milligrams of fluoxetine um, or um, 5 milligrams of uh, escitalopram. Um, so the, the dosing there on the right is what the effective dose is. That's not necessarily the highest dose, um, but it's the dose that you need to get to determine if it's effective or not. Um, mirtazapine, the last line there, um, 45 milligrams is the maximum dose. One thing to note about 45 milligrams of mirtazapine is the most effective for being an antidepressant. It's not the most effective if you want to improve um, their sleep or their appetite. So mirtazapine tends to hit more serotonin receptors at those higher doses, uh, but it hits more um, histaminic receptors to increase appetite or sleep at the lower doses, so 15 or even 7.5 milligrams. Psychotic depression, which is major depressive disorder severe with psychotic features, um, is treated um, with both an antidepressant and an antipsychotic medication. You have to use both in order to treat them. Um, we also use ECT to treat um, psychotic depression. That's something that we do here at Mary Greeley. There aren't many hospitals in the state that do ECT, but we do do it here. I think a lot of providers are surprised um, that ECT is recommended for elderly patients um, just being under more risk to go under anesthesia because they are put on, placed under general anesthesia. Um, but it is one of the safest procedures done under general anesthesia and it can be up to 95% effective for psychotic depression. All right, I have a few case presentations mixed in along the way. Um, they're all semi-real, semi-made uh, up. So uh, first one, a 68-year-old male who has one month status post myocardial infarction and coronary artery, coronary artery bypass grafting who is currently outpatient participating in a cardiac rehab program. His therapists were concerned with his lack of progress, but he seems more apathetic. Um, family also notes that he's withdrawn from them. He won't go to family activities. Um, he's also um, losing weight and has a poor appetite. Um, so this man clearly is, is uh, having problems after the MI, and it's very common for people to have depression, um, status post. Um, heart attack, so he is um, suffering from depression, what, and the treatment that I would recommend is likely an SSRI. So treated depression in those patients with cardiac events, ha they have a lower odds of recurrent cardiac events. All right, moving on to neuropsychiatric symptoms of neurocognitive disorders, which sounds super complex. <laughs> more comics for you. All right, so a neurocognitive disorder is the new fangled term from DSM um, for any dementias or cognitive impairments. There's a lot of different causes of um, neurocognitive disorders include Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body disease, uh, traumatic brain injuries, um, and they can be due to multiple things. So symptoms of neurocognitive um, disorders are both cognitive and neuropsychiatric. So cognitive are the impairments in memory, language, orientation, recognition, and their executive function. And then there are also their neuropsychiatric symptoms. So in the DSM, if you've seen a with behavioral disturbances diagnosis, those are the neuropsychiatric symptoms. So what are the neuropsychiatric symptoms 
um, dysphoria or depression, apathy, irritability, lability, um, delusions, uh, feeling like pe someone has stolen something or, or moved things in your home, um, hallucinations, which are usually visual in uh, dementias. They can be auditory or, or, or olfactory, though. Um, apparent, aberrant motor activity, which is just wandering from home, rummaging through things in the home. Um, nighttime behavioral disturbances, the, the typical sundowning that we've all heard of. Um, aggression or agitation, anxiety, euphoria, disinhibition, which can be social or sexual. And then appetite or eating disturbances. So why are these important? So they can uh, precede the memory impairments in dementia. Um, one of the most common is in frontotemporal dementias where you, you see a lot of behavioral disturbances before the cognitive impairments start. Um, often with Alzheimer's though, there is a preceding episode where they're apathetic or depressed or anxious. And that's one of the first signs that we can see of dementia. Patients that experience uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms have a greater impairment in their activities of daily living. Their cognitive decline can be more rapid. Their quality of life is worse. Um, they usually go into nursing homes earlier than someone without those neuropsychiatric symptoms because they're more difficult to care for. And it can cause greater caregiver depression. So estimated there's a, th a third of the costs from dementia care is due to these neuropsychiatric symptoms. So the prevalence, um, so more than 50%, less than 90% is, is the basic number of how many uh, patients with dementia experience these neuropsychiatric symptoms. Um, the most common ones are depression, apathy, and agitation. Uh, agitation is usually the one that psychiatry gets called for the most because it's, um, it interferes with their care more. So why do, why do they develop neuropsychiatric symptoms? Um, really, there's no specific reason why. It's just there's a neurodegenerative process, and it, it breaks up those circuit, the circuitry involved in their um, affect, their behavior, motivation, and perception of stimuli. Um, they can have difficulty adapting to their surroundings as their cognitive abilities decline. Um, sometimes it's that the caregiver um, is not appropriately matched with the patient, um, or they have unmet needs, and many other things, including medical problems, can precipitate these. So cognition with um, major neurocognitive disorders, it tends to have a downward trajectory. So over the course of time, they're not improving at any point with treatment. Uh, it's usually just being able to slow the decline. With neuropsychiatric symptoms, they can wax and wane over time. So sometimes they completely go away. Someone will have these symptoms for weeks to months, and they'll go away. Sometimes they last longer. But they do fluctuate over the course of time. So non-pharmacologic management of these symptoms is the preferred uh, first-line treatment because there's so much less risk compared to pharmacologic treatment but it's less likely to be used due to um, provider training, the amount of time that it requires to implement these things. There's a lack of reimbursement. Um, there's not many clear guidelines, and there's a perceived lack of eff efficacy over medication. So there's three targets for these uh, management techniques that include um, the person with dementia, the caregiver, and their environment. So the person with dementia, there are a host of therapies that um, one can try. Um, the ones in red here are the ones that have the most evidence, but the evidence is not very strongly based. Um, and I can tell you, even during my psychiatry residency program, we got none of this. So, um, Caregiver, um, sometimes, and what we find most helpful is being, being called to help someone that's having these episodes of agitation especially, is identifying what happened directly before this. Because often there's some sort of environmental or caregiver trigger that caused the behavior. So being able to um, 
find the precipitant for the behavior is helpful because that can be a target of what to change instead of necessarily medicating um, the patient. Um, environment, so stimulation is a fine balance. So no one wants to be in solitary confinement. So under stimulation um, is not optimal. Um, but over overstimulation is also a major problem. Um, so if there's a lot of noise, uh, like at my house, or if there's a lot of people walking by the door, or lots, even lots of clutter in the room just make, can make someone feel overwhelmed. Um, access to chemicals or sharps or easy exit out of the home environment, if they're in the home, could be a problem. Um, also, it's important that we all need some sort of structure, um, just like no one wants to be in solitary confinement where it's the same 24 hours a day. Um, people need structure in their day, even if it's simple structure, simple activities. Um, the activities need to match what they're interested in because if you're being forced to color and you don't like coloring, that's not going to, to calm someone down. Moving on to pharmacologic management. Um, so we have several different types of medications that are used. We'll start off with the antipsychotics. Um, so believe it or not, there is no clear evidence for the efficacy of antipsychotics in the use of neuro in management of neuropsychiatric symptoms. Um, they do have the strongest evidence base of all of the medications, but it's still not clear. So the benefits are moderate be at best with an effect size of 0.13 to 0.16. Um, there is a threefold increase in cerebrovascular events with using these uh, medications. And there's an increase in mortality. There's a black box warning on all antipsychotics um, for use of treating these behavioral issues with patients with dementia. Um, so there used to be an indication, but the FDA disapproved them um, in 2005 for atypical antipsychotics, which would be risperidone, olanzapine, um, aripiprazole, and then in 2008 for typical antipsychotics, which would be like haloperidol or fufenazine. So if you're going to use an antipsychotic, which one should you use? Um, atypical antipsychotics tend to be more effective for certain symptoms, like the anger, uh, aggression, and paranoid ideas. So there's most evidence for risperidone, olanzapine, and aripiprazole. There's less evidence for quetiapine. Um, this seems to be due to the fact that the doses used um, are not as high as they, they could have been. So uh, quetiapine um, tends to have less dopamine blockade until you get to higher doses. Um, for example, to treat um, psychotic disorders, we need doses anywhere of 600 to 1,200 uh, milligrams, uh, whereas with dementia, it tends to be used in 12.5, 25, up to 50 milligrams at a time. Um, Haldol, haloperidol is recommended only for emergency, emergency situations because it does increase um, the risk of um, death, um, especially within the first four weeks of treatment. Um, this, just some antipsychotic dosing guidelines. Um, risperidone and Seroquel, I like to dose more than once a day. Um, Seroquel is sedating, but it can help with some of that agitation and restlessness during the day. Um, risperidone also can do the same. Olanzapine is probably, um, some people tolerate it during the day. Um, uh, and but some don't. So that's one that, that may or may not be used in the morning, but may be too sedating for them to function otherwise. So um, there is one antipsychotic that's FDA approved for neuropsychiatric symptoms. Um, Pimvisarin is uh, not a dopamine antagonist like all, all other antipsychotics. It's an, a 5-HT2A um, receptor antagonist. Um, it's only approved for Parkinson's psychosis. Um, so hallucinations and delusions secondary to Parkinson's. Um, it still has the black box warning on it. I have only seen one patient on it, and I know that that person had a very long battle with the insurance company to get on that medication. Antidepressants. So there's conflicting evidence. There seems to be some benefit in some patients. Um, this may be more in the population that has the, the depression, anxiety, apathy symptoms. Um, they are better tolerated than tricyclic antidepressants. Um, there's been some studies 
Again, with citalopram, doses up to 30 milligrams, which we know if we're using 30 milligrams, we have to do an EKG. Um, but it did reduce agitation and caregiver distress. So, um, and like I said, just because something in psychiatry doesn't have an FDA indication doesn't mean it might not be helpful. So other antidepressants could have the same benefit. Um, trazodone is also um, used for some people with dementia with the behavioral issues or agi agitation. Um, I think that has, various psychiatrists use it, some don't. I think it depends on the training um, and uh, if they, in through the training, used uh, trazodone. I tend to use trazodone um, during the daytime for some anxiety and um, dementia type symptoms. Um, cholinesterase inhibitors and memantine. Um, behavior is generally a secondary outcome when you look at these studies. Um, so we're, they're mostly looking at cognition. So there are possible benefits of using um, the cholinesterase inhibitors, memantine, um, but the studies aren't well proven. Same with mood stabilizers. There's very few well-designed studies, so, um, but the adverse effects often outweigh the benefits of those. And then there are other medications under investigation. Benzodiazepines, please don't use them. <laughs> um, so there, if there's an acute crisis, they can be used, but not on a regular basis. Um, they can cause paradoxical disinhibition. So if they're being used to control behaviors, they could just be making behaviors worse. So this uh, case presentation is based upon the behavioral health unit's longest stay. Um, to be 137 days. Um, she was a 72-year-old woman with frontotemporal dementia, hypothyroidism, and hypertension. She was a very healthy woman with the exception of her dementia. Um, she had been discharged from two nursing homes due to aggressive behavior. And she had been admitted to the hospital twice for prior for behavioral disturbances, not to our unit though. Uh, she was minimally verbal and only really able to recognize her husband and say her husband's name. So over the course of her 137 days, um, she was stabilized on sertraline, olanzapine, um, like I mentioned trazodone. She was on trazodone three times a day. It did not make her tired. <laughs> and levothyroxine for her hypothyroidism. So she had lots of difficulty throughout her stay. Um, we all knew each other quite well. Um, she was one-to-one -one the whole stay. Um, but she was notably um, more aggressive with non-Caucasian staff members. Um, her husband um, informed us after about a month of this that she had been a racist person most of her life, so this, and that the, her dementia was just only bringing out the worst in her personality. So, and she was a fiery redhead when in her prime, so. Um, so some of the non-pharmacologic therapies that we utilized were the reminiscence therapy, uh, physical activity, she liked to take walks, um, decreasing the stimulation, and we found that once she started to ramp up, the best thing that we could do is to leave the room and leave her alone, because then she would be able to kind of forget about what was happening and calm herself down. So ultimately, I can't remember how many nursing homes we <laughs> referred her to. It was in the hundreds, um, but she was declined by all of them. Um, her husband had been her caregiver off and on at times throughout the course of this illness. Um, and he also had um, very mild dementia, but he was starting to have depress d depression due to the caregiving burdens and had been suicidal at times. So there was no way that we could just release her to him in, for full care. Um, so sh there was, she was discharged to home, but with 12 hours of home care per day. She tended to sleep all night with her medication, so there wasn't a lot of time where um, she, she and her husband were alone without um, any staff there. There were, the backyard was um, locked off so that she, if she was in the backyard, she couldn't get out of the backyard, and there were alarms on the doors, and there were all kinds of safety precautions that were put in the home before she discharged. All right, delirium. Last comic strip. All right, what 
does delirium look like? So it's a rapid development of disorientation, confusion, and global cognitive impairment. So there's a disturbance of consciousness, um, altered awareness of their environment. Um, they have difficulty focusing or sustaining attention. Their cognition's impaired. Um, they can be seeing uh, illusions or hallucinations. So um, in their room, you know, they may be an abscess machine, but they may be seeing it as a person or something else. Or they could be experiencing visual hallucinations, which is seeing something when nothing is there. Um, that's more common than auditory hallucinations. Um, delirium tends to have a fluctuating course. So over the course of e even a morning, one provider may see them and they seem normal. Two hours later, another provider sees them and they're disoriented and confused. And then by afternoon, they may be back to the, their normal selves again and it just varies throughout the day. There tend to be sleep-wake disturbances. These are patients that are up half the night or all night and then try difficult to uh, arouse during the day. Um, and then it can vary from restlessness and agitation to somnolence. So they could be pulling at things, pulling IVs out, or catheters out, ripping their room apart, or they could be hard to wake up. So different types of deliriums. There's substance intoxication and withdrawal deliriums, medication-induced um, due to a medical condition or due to multiple etiologies. I'd say the most common that we see are multiple etiologies. Um, so delirium can be acute or persistent. I think most people are surprised to find out that delirium can last weeks to months. So their course, you know, most of the time we think of it over the course of hours to days, and then they improve. But it can linger on, and it can take them months to recover from this. Um, there's various levels of activity, like we talked about. There's hypoactive delirium, which often looks like depression. There's um, hyperactive delirium, and then they can vary in the course of the delirium um, between the two activity levels. So these numbers are not the kind of statistics that you want to see. <laughs> but, um, so it's an up, up to 56% of hospitalized patients. Um, and older hospitalized patients, the number varies somewhere between 20 and 80%, which is a good range, so it could be anywhere in the middle. Um, Non-mechanically vent ventilated ICU patients, um, 20 to 50 percent, but then when you look at someone that's been intubated, their risk of having um, delirium is anywhere from 60 to 80 percent. So what does that mean? So they have longer hospital stays. They can be in the hospital a week longer um, than someone else. They're more likely to be discharged to skilled care or nursing home care. So the, it's 16% discharged to nursing home versus only 3% those without delirium. Uh, hospital costs tend to be higher. They're more likely to die in the hospital or with, within one year of hospital discharge. Um, it's similar, uh, in hospital deaths are similar to that of MI or sepsis. Um, patients older than 70 who've had delirium have a 62% incre increased risk of death at one year. Um, so, if someone's experienced delirium, they're much more likely to be later diagnosed with dementia. Um, the, there's no clear cause or effect relationship, but what's known that um, someone may be experiencing dementia symptoms, and then the delirium just advances the progression of the illness. Uh, delirium is a medical it's a psychiatric diagnosis, but it, the origin is medical, and it's treated medically. Um, so the workup can include the million-dollar workup, so anything there plus more, but it should be tailored to what you think is the, it could be the cause of delirium. Sometimes it's not known, so you end up doing a whole workup, but most of the time you can try and pinpoint it more uh, rapidly. A mnemonic for causes of delirium is I watch death infectious, withdrawal, acute metabolic trauma, CNS pathology, hypoxia, deficiencies, endocrinopathies, acute vascular toxins, or heavy metals. So that would be that the workup is trying to identify. So we have both predisposing and precipitating risk factors. Um, predisposing, most important, I think, um, age. The older someone is, the more likely they are to um, develop a uh, delirium, uh, vision impairments, and dementia. 
also um, predispose someone to developing del delirium. Um, hypocalcemia, there's an odds ratio of 31 if someone has hypocalcemia and also am hyperamylacemia. Low BMI also is a predisposing risk factor. Uh, precipitating risk factors um, at iatrogenic events, getting out of bed less frequently, lots of medications, um, infection, there's an odds ratio of 18, and hypotension, odds ratio of 20. So those are the highest there. Um, so here at Mary Greeley, at least in the ICU, they're doing a, a screening assessment for uh, delirium. Um, so uh, this first slide, they assess their sedation, and that's anywhere from one, which is unarousable, to seven. Uh, everyone wants to be at four, which is calm and cooperative. And then there's also the delirium assessment. So that's um, monitoring if there's an acute change of their mental status. Um, best way to determine that, if there's family in the room, is to ask them if they're different. <laughs> it's hard for us to sometimes know because we don't know what the patient is like, especially if they have um, dementia, but this is a good, the family is a good way to, to know. Um, monitoring for inattention and then using that score for their level of consciousness and also looking for any disorganized thinking. So preventing and treating delirium are nearly the same. Um, use the, we'll use the same non-pharmacologic treat methods. Um, pharmacologic management comes in when we're actually treating delirium. Um, Non-pharmacologic management is close observation, having a tilicitor or one-to-one -one if needed. Um, consistent nursing care, so if they can have the same nurse every day that that nurse is working, that benefits them. Uh, frequent reassurance, where they are, why they're there, and that they're safe. Uh, Mary Greeley does a good job of having the, the whiteboards that tell uh, where they are and what the date is. And sometimes when we're evaluating a patient over time, we can tell where they are in their improvement in their delirium symptoms because at first they won't be able to tell you where they are or what the date is. But as they improve, they'll at least know to look to the whiteboard to tell you what the date is. So when you know they're better is when they're not looking at that whiteboard at all. So um, decreasing the external stimulation. Um, one thing is I hate it when I walk in the room and it's completely dark and the blinds are closed and it's the middle of the day. That is not helpful for delirious patients because they can't determine what time of day it is. So it perpetuates um, their poor sleep-wake cycle and also um, those shadows can cause more illusions. So lights on, windows open during the day, quiet and dark at night. Um, Encouraging family involvement, making sure they have their glasses and hearing aids, uh, making sure they're up and walking. Start PT and OT early. <laughs> um, normalizing their sleep-wake cycle. Um, I also dislike that blood draws are done between 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning um, because that does disrupt them, especially if they've been delirious. I know it's helpful from a provider standpoint to have those results when you come in, but it also um, can perpetuate their sleep-wake cycle problems. Um, and then just making sure we're treating any urinary or fecal problems. Avoiding polypharmacy is one of the pharmacologic management techniques. Um, and then discontinuing any medications that can be contributing. Um, benzodiazepines, antihistamines, opioid pain medications. Um, those are It's a fine balance between pain control and then um, what's causing and can be what pain control, which can cause um, delirium versus treating with opioid pain medications, with which can also cause delirium. So there's a fine line that you have to run there, um, and all kinds of other medications. So antipsychotics should be used for dangerous agitation. Um, I gave several examples here. Um, Haldol is nice because there is um, liquid and tablet forms. There's IV and IM. Um, for elderly patients, we want to use anywhere from 0.5 to 2 milligrams every two to four hours. Um, five milligrams initially is an inappropriate dose. Um, and then monitor with an EKG if you're using IV Haldol. 
Um, Risperidone and olanzapine both come in dissolvable tablets, so sometimes that nice, that's nice because if you lose IV access and you don't want to give an IM, um, sometimes if you just pop it in their mouth, it dissolves within you know, 10 or 15 seconds. Facilitating their sleep is also important. Uh, we do have melatonin on formulary here. They're three milligram tablets, so nurses would probably want you to use 1.5 to three milligrams as the starting dose. Um, I also use a lot, quite a bit of Remelteon, uh, which acts on melatonin receptors in the brain. It does not act on GABA receptors, so it should not cause worsening of their delirium. Um, so benzodiazepines are used uh, to treat delirium when it's due to um, benzodiazepine or alcohol withdrawal, barbiturate withdrawal. And that's the only situation where it's appropriate. Um, lorazepam would be preferable because it's shorter acting. We also use quite a bit of Librium here. And then there's some management of specific deliriums, but we're running short on time. So here's another case presentation. 63-year-old male with history of early onset dementia and anxiety who presented status four days status post lap coli. He was transferred from an outside hospital because he, uh, there was concern for pneumonia and hypoxia, and he was requiring 15 liters of O2. Um, so when he was brought in, he was started on Zosin for pneumonia. He was given fentanyl for pain, and his home psychiatric medications of clomipramine, fluoxetine, and lorazepam were resumed. His hypoxia improved, and he was weaned to room air. Um, but then he became increasingly confused and agitated. Um, so lorazepam was then discontinued. He was starting on vermelteon for sleep regulation, but he continued to be agitated. So it's not clear whether that was that the lorazepam hadn't just cleared his system yet, or he's just already precipitated this delirium. Um, but Haldol was used for his agitation. It did not seem to be helping. Um, nursing staff uh, thought maybe he was just experiencing quite a bit of pain, and so he was given fentanyl. He ended up having 275 micrograms of fentanyl in a 24-hour period. Um, the concern was he was now eight days status post lap coli, so he should not have needed any narcotic pain medication for his surgery at this point. Um, there was no other medication ordered for pain, so the only thing he had available for pain was fentanyl. Um, so the fentanyl was discontinued. He was given Tylenol. Pain was well controlled, and he, he cleared within 24 hours. So, um, Another case presentation, 82-year-old female admitted with acute on chronic kidney injury. Creatinine was well above her usual baseline at 3.5. She also had a UTI that had been recently treated outpatient. She had just finished treatment for that. She was somnolent, weak, and had episodes of confusion. She was having visual hallucinations. Um, she was withdrawn, and she appeared depressed. Um, so psychiatrists consulted asking um, if we would treat her depression. So um, during her evaluation, she was only oriented times two. Um, she couldn't maintain attention. Her memory was impaired. And family was there and reported that this was a rapid change from her baseline. So the confusion, the hallucinations, and her mood were changed from baseline. Um, so did she have depression? No. She had hypoactive delirium. Um, so one of the things is make sure you're asking people what they're, what they're like and if this was an acute change from their baseline. So. All right. Questions? So how strongly do you feel about cognitive enhancers in dementia? I feel like they, they have um, their use. Um, normally, by the time I am seeing someone, since I'm only on an inpatient setting, uh, it's generally a little bit too late to, to start someone on, on those if you're not seeing it early. Um, I do feel like they can help to slow the decline, especially if someone's in an um, like if they're living at home or in assisted living, I think we need to do all we can to try and sustain them in that environment. Um, I think where um, I have more questions about their utility is when someone goes into a memory care unit, how much we're going to just continue to, to de delay their decline. So. 
Uh, Casey, I agree with you about the benzodiazepines for the anxious patients. Do you have uh, an SSRI or SNRI that you usually recommend for people who have a lot of anxiety, or do you try to go with a cognitive behavioral therapy or a combination of both? Um, I think a combination of both, especially if it's something that's um, if it, if it's something that's very um, uh, temporary, then then sometimes psychotherapy can be more beneficial. If it's more longer lasting, you know, psychotherapy is also used, but I would also use a medication in conjunction with that. Um, one of my go-to SSRIs for anxiety is sertraline. Um, I think that it, you know, fluoxetine can be helpful, but it also can be activating, so it can make them feel more anxious. Um, but there's also a lot of um, dosing flexibility with fluoxetine, so you can go much higher on the dose, so that can be helpful too. question was, if someone develops SAADH on, on SSRI, what do you go to next? Um, so you, I would, if, if they have anxiety, that's one of the problems, because something like bupropion does not cause SAADH, mirtazapine does not, um, but the utility of bupropion for anxiety is, is nil, so you wouldn't want to use that. Um, but that's, those, those are two that I would think of if someone has SAADH. All right, thank you.